um, Google Drive. Um, and so I'm going to just send folks the URL for that. And then um, uh, folks can follow along as they would like, I think, is probably all we're going to be able to do here. Um, let me just grab the link. Okay. Uh, so there's the link to the slides. Um, I'm going to go open them myself um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Thanks, David. That's a great uh, idea. It's Nick's idea, actually. It's Nick's um, idea, actually. Um, and maybe when, right. the, when Collaborate finally right. catches up with us, <laughs> we'll have it. Oh, yeah, well, I have no idea well. how we'll find that out at this point. Yeah. But find that out at this point. No, there isn't any indicators as well. Okay. So thank you for folks are able, through. Okay. So folks are able. Looks like folks are able to uh, get I'll it. I'll just the, do a quick introduction, if the, that's okay. In, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I'm excited to um, introduce uh, Professor David Sheffer. Um, for this talk for Learning Analytics SIG. My name is Sakina Al Haddad. Um, so David's going to talk to us about very interesting things. We've heard many times um, that, you know, learning analytics has the potential to help us understand complex learning processes and not just outcomes. And a lot of the work that um, David does and leads um, is, you know, sort of is around very creative, I think, methodological approaches to help us understand these complex deep processes of learning. Um, and so, David, I'll hand it over to you. Super. Thank you very much. Um, Super. Thank you very and, uh, much. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, welcome my only request is that folks be sure to, um, be sure to close your, uh, turn off your mics your, because uh, turn off your mic for some reason I get an echo, uh, an echo uh, when, it, when anybody has when their it, mic open, uh, their which mic makes open. it very difficult to, uh, makes it very uh, difficult to figure out what's going on, uh, to, be going on. Um, uh, to be honest. So uh, it would be helpful if you could just um, uh, turn your mics off. Um, all right. Uh, yes, Hazel, is, has the echo stopped now? Yep, I th think it was because second as yeah. Mac was on, I turned it off. Okay, super. Well, um, let's uh, let's uh, see what we can do. Um, sorry, I just have to get back to where I have the slides now. Once. Um, okay, so uh, unfortunately, the slides aren't numbered, so that's going to make it a little difficult um, to follow along in the talk. But I will do my best to uh, tell you periodically what slide I'm on. Um, you, of course, can advance through the, sli through the slides to the end, um, and uh, feel free to do that if you want. Uh, the story is more fun if you kind of follow along in real time, though. Um, anyway, uh, as Akina said, I'm David Williamson Schaefer. I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, I also have an appointment at Alberg University in Copenhagen. Um, and I, I'm, I'd like to talk about uh, uh, exactly what Sakina uh, said, which is um, thinking about how we can uh, use big data uh, not just to um, mine for uh, uh, generic outcomes, but actually uh, model the kinds of processes that we care about um, in learning. Um, my background is uh, somebody who studies um, complex collaborative problem solving. Um, and what I mean by that is uh, places uh, where people uh, solve problems in the real world that don't have uh, easy or obvious answers and that require uh, uh, input from uh, multiple perspectives and from multiple people. Um, and the reason that this is important is that uh, I think of, of learning as a process of enculturation. I'm now on what I think is the third slide that says learning is a process of enculturation. Um, to give you a quick uh, uh, a sense of what I mean by that, um, uh, if you move to the uh, first very colorful slide there, um, that's actually a screenshot from the, uh, the computer game Webkins. Um, uh, which is uh, uh, one of my one of my children's um, favorite games, um, and uh, in this game uh, you buy a plush toy, a stuffed animal, and then the stuffed animal appears in the world of the game, and you can ask your stuffed animal questions. I've moved on to the next slide now, um, and the your pet can give you kind of pro-social responses. Um, if you move the the uh, slide where the pet is actually giving the response. Um, and then uh, uh, it turns out the main mechanic for the game 
um, I'm now on the slide, on the next slide, uh, is uh, to buy things for your pet. Um, you buy them furniture for their room, you buy them handbags and other things like that. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in order to do that, you have to be able to earn money. Um, there's a few ways you can do that in the game. Uh, you can gamble. I'm now on the slide with the wheel, obviously. Uh, you can play um, math games, again, to the next slide. Uh, one example is Booger gets an A. Um, in this, in this uh, game, if you go to the next slide, you can see that you uh, take, uh, try and find two smaller numbers that will add up to a bigger number. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that the, the game gives you uh, pro-social messages about mathematics. Um, you can, and I kid you not, go to work in the mines. I'm obviously now on the slide with the mine. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see a host of other 21st century jobs you can do, like delivering the newspaper, being someone's personal assistant, painting fences, and so on. Um, oh, the slides are showing you collaborate? Excellent. Um, let, me, let me see if I can find them, uh, and then maybe we'll um, switch back there. So just I'm just going to pause for one second. Oh, look at that. Um, excellent. All right, so uh, you, of course, are, are free to follow along on the, um, uh, with the PDF, but uh, the, I'm going to stop talking about which slide I am because they're actually back on Collaborate here. So I hope people will join us there. Um, okay, uh, right. Uh, so my point is that learning is a process of enculturation. What it means is learning how to participate in uh, the way that some community of practice behaves. I um, mean, what that mean, means in turn is adopting something that uh, Jim G calls a big discourse, a socially accepted association among ways of using language, of thinking, of feeling, behaving, valuing, and so on. It's a way of participating in the kinds of activities and the kinds of talk that people, that some group of people uh, uh, share. Um, so let me give you some of a quick example of what it means to uh, be fortunate or not another. Um, so I'm from New York City originally, uh, I'm a city boy, um, and so when I see uh, dirt on the ground, the main thing that I think about is whether it's wet enough that my shoes are going to get dirty if I walk there. Um, on the other hand, um, archaeologists look at a piece of dirt and they think much differently. They think about whether the dirt provides evidence that of what was in that location sometime in the past, some, something like a post hole, for example. They see the dirt as a window into um, events that happened many, many years ago. Uh, and the idea, by the way, is that uh, if, you, if there was a post hole in the ground, when the post hole degrades over time, um, the, there are remnants of the wood from the post that look different than the surrounding soil. Um, so one of the ways that archaeologists examine the soil um, something called the Munzel color chart. So they actually take samples of soil, they compare it to uh, these uh, known soil colors, and then they can look for places where the uh, color of the soil is different. Um, in other words, when archaeologists looks at this uh, 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 dirt, they're actually um, seeing it in a very different way than I am. They are thinking about things like soil, the Munzel color chart, post holes, and these are all what Charles Goodwin, the anthropologist Charles Goodwin, calls codes. There are ways in which people uh, make sense of the world around them. In other words, what it means to understand a culture is to understand the way with, that people within that culture make sense of the world, which means understanding the, um, their, the codes by which they uh, see the world. Um, so uh, one of the things that uh, I would suggest that um, folks might do um, is uh, think a little bit about what, some, what are some of the codes in the things you study. Given that we have only about 45 minutes for the webinar, I think rather than having you actually take some time to do that and then get some feedback from you, much as I would like to do that, um, I think maybe it, it, it makes sense uh, to suggest that that's something that you spend a little time thinking about in the back of your mind as we're going forward. It's obviously helpful for you to be able to map the things that I'm talking about into the domains in which you work. Um, I hope that makes sense to everybody. If somebody disagrees, please uh, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Okay, super. So we'll, we'll take that as the adopted plan here. Um, so, uh, so there's one other thing about these codes, though, which is that they don't actually exist just in isolation. So in my work, I talk about the fact that what's important about a culture is the way that these codes connect to one another. In other words, a Munsell color chart is meaningful to an archaeologist 
because it's a way of measuring soil. And it's meaningful to an archaeologist because it's a way of identifying things like post holes. In other words, we're not just interested in isolated codes, we're interested in the way they connect to one another systematically. Um, in my work, I've called this an epistemic frame, and it's a nice metaphor. You can think about it like a pair of glasses that when you put it on, lets you see the world from some perspective. Um, it lets you see the codes that are relevant um, to some community of practice, and it lets you see the way those things are connected to one another. Um, in other words, Understanding a culture means understanding a discourse, which means not only understanding the way that people encode the world, but the way in which those encodings are systematically connected to one another. Uh, and let me give you a, a quick example. Uh, the example will be from my own work, although as I've said already, I think it's helpful if you're also thinking in parable, parallel about what these things might look like in your work as well. Um, so uh, one of the things that we do to uh, uh, develop and assess complex problem solving is put students in what we call virtual internships. So these are online simulations um, where students have an opportunity to uh, take the role of uh, problem solvers, uh, people like engineers and architects and uh, doctors and lawyers um, <clears throat> with the idea that they're gonna understand something about uh, the, the way this community of practice, uh, way community of practice functions. Um, the, uh, the one I'm uh, gonna talk about today is called Rescue Shell um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to pop in a URL for a, a video for those who are um, interested. Uh, I don't necessarily recommend that you look at the video right now for the obvious reasons that it's going to be hard, make it hard to um, follow along with everything else we're doing here. Um, but here's a here's a video for it. Here's a link for a video for it. Um, Rescue Shell students are um, working as engineers um, and they are uh, designing a robotic exoskeleton, so an exoskeleton for uh, rescue workers. Um, and to do this, they read some background materials. Uh, they use a design tool to create uh, prototypes, which they send to a virtual uh, testing lab for testing. They get the results back. Um, they work in their teams to uh, use the results to determine what configurations of uh, materials, controls, power sources, and so on will produce the optimal device in terms of things like cost and payload and agility and uh, battery life and so on. Um, uh, the, the URL for the video is also uh, up on your screen now, although I think it's easier to get at from the uh, comments on the side. Uh, so one of the things that uh, happens in the virtual internship is that students uh, communicate with their other uh, teammates as they're solving the design problem in chat. So we have a record not only of what they did to solve the problem, the actions that they took, but also how they were talking, how they were thinking while they solved the problem. And uh, just to give a quick example, like here's a one line from one of the chats uh, in the uh, game. I, I probably don't need to read it, but as you can see, um, the students are talking about data. They're talking about particular pieces of information about how this design performed. Um, and they're also talking about the technical requirements, that there are certain company standards that, they, that are the minimum values for things that, um, that they're trying to achieve. Um, in other words, what we want to understand is culture and this process by which codes are related to one another. But what we actually have is discourse. We have the things that some group of people said and did in the world. And in fact, we don't actually have discourse. What we have is something that looks maybe like this. We have a, a log file or field notes. We have a record of discourse, which is not exactly the same thing as the discourse because it's, it's not complete. The problem is that we can't just go from our field notes and directly understand what's happening in the culture. We can't really go from the field notes to the discourse. In fact, we can't even necessarily go directly from the, to, from the field notes to the way that um, the encoding of data works. To do that, we need a piece of machinery, which um, Andrew Pickering describes as a machinic grip. Um, and the idea of a machinic grip, uh, uh, Pickering argues, is that the phenomenon of, of, in the world are always, they're fuzzy, they're nebulous, they're difficult to get a hold of, there are many perspectives you could, from which you could look at them. And the machinic grip is the way in which um, the tools of science attach to a phenomenon. And once you've done this attachment, now you can systematically manipulate it, you can look at it in a more controlled way to try and understand it. Um, the, a machinic grip in uh, ethnography uh, is something called a code, right? And uh, sorry, a uh, uh, small c code. And what the machinic grip does is it takes these big c codes, the culturally relevant and meaningful aspects of a discourse, and it points to specific things, these small c codes, which are things that count as evidence or warrant for the codes. 
to put it more simply, a small C code is a list of the things that you might see in the field notes in the discourse that tells you that uh, people in the world are making a particular meaning. <laughs> um, so again, uh, I'm not going to uh, stop and have people um, uh, do this and kind of reflect back, although that would be fun if we had a little more time. Um, but one of the things you might think about are what are the small C codes in the things that you study? So what are some categories of things that you care about? Um, I've showed you data and technical requirements, so and so on. Perhaps in uh, in the things you study, it would be um, uh, motiva uh, motivation or excitement. Um, it might be uh, understanding of some mathematical concept. Um, it might be uh, making a decision, right? And then what would you see in the data that would tell you that this thing that is, you think is meaningful is actually happening? Um, now, uh, again, this, there's nothing particularly magic about this. People who do qualitative research use coding all the time. Um, they uh, set out uh, the names of the codes. Those codes have some kind of definition, and then typically uh, a good code book provides examples of the kinds of things that you would see in the discourse um, that would indicate the code is present. Uh, in other words, what we have is, on the right side, the things that we're trying to explain, the way people make meaning in a, in a culture um, by enacting a discourse that connects uh, things that are meaningful in some particular way. What we actually have in the world, the, the objects that we have to work with, are the things that people have said and done, recorded in field notes or a log file. And we can see the small C codes. We can see the evidence for them, the way that evidence is systematically related to one another. That's why this connection between the small C codes and the big C codes, that's the mechanical grip. That's where we're able to, to uh, get purchase on the thing we're trying to understand, the meaning on the right, through the data that we have on the left. Um, and of course, again, there's nothing miraculous about this. This is a project that a pro uh, process that ethnography is trying to understand um, how things work and why things work within some group of people. Um, the obvious contrast to this is thin description, <laughs> which is description where um, we have information about uh, what's happening, but we don't have enough of it to actually be sure that what that the claim that we're making um, is robust in the data. Um, and of course, the difference is that uh, in thin descri in thin description, we have maybe one example or one small slice of what's happening. Um, and what we want is actually to see that same pattern, to see the uh, the things that were uh, that are of import recur over and over again. Um, and this is a process that uh, a qualitative research refer researchers refer to as theoretical saturation. And the idea is you reach a point where gathering more data is not actually telling you that much more about the uh, environment that you're uh, that you're studying. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about kind of for the remainder of the time that I'm presenting, and then we'll have time, time I hope, for discussion, um, is how we get this kind of theoretical saturation. That is how we understand whether we've seen enough to see that these, uh, the relationships among the codes that we think are happening in the data are, are there. Uh, and there's a few different ways to do that. One way is to, you know, give multiple examples. Um, and, uh, and, but uh, there's also a quantitative way to do that, and that's what really the focus of uh, what I'm talking about today is. Um, so let me give you an example of, of what it means for codes to be connected. Again, I'm just going to borrow from Rescue Shell. Um, and let me tell you a little story here. Um, so this is a, a section of one team's design work. Um, and we can see here that uh, Justin, who's the design advisor, he's a fictional character in the simulation, um, asked this, this team uh, to introduce themselves and indicate uh, what part of the design they've been working with. So the way the, the internship works, uh, students are in teams where each of them looks at a different actuator, a different uh, motor that gets used to move the exoskeleton. Um, and then they do a jigsaw. Uh, they regroup and they form a new team where each person in that team has studied the, the uh, pros and cons of a different part of the design problem. So that's what's happening here. Um, and what we can see is that the rest of the team uh, introduces themselves um, and talks about the different actuators that they were working with. As the design process continues, uh, we can see that Zachary starts to actually, yeah, oh, sorry, um, starts to actually talk about, um, controls are a little tricky here, um, uh, to talk about not only his design, 
but the way in which the design did or didn't fulfill the technical requirements uh, of the company. Daniel follows similarly, talking about reaching all the cons uh, internal consultants requests. Gabrielle talks about meeting the preferred and required requirements. Um, and then soon after this in the conversation, uh, the conversation takes an important turn when Michael asks about the results of their best prototypes. So instead of speaking in general terms about the fact that they were good or bad, he's actually asking for the data. We then see that the, uh, through the next part of the conversation, um, Zachary and Lena and Gabrielle all now talk about the specific uh, properties of their, um, of their devices. They talk about the cost being 12,000 versus 14,000. They talk about the recharge intervals. They talk about the safety ratings and so forth. Um, and all of this now leads Zachary to start to draw conclusions about the way in which these devices can be compared to one another. And then finally, Elizabeth, actually takes the step towards thinking about design trade-offs. She says, we need to determine which attributes are the most important to us so that we can meet these consultants' needs and trade off against the different pieces of the design. Um, in other words, if you think about the way design works, right, there are technical requirements, and what the students are going to have to do is make trade-offs based on these technical requirements. They're going to do better or worse on some and not others in order to find a des uh, design that they think is optimal. But they don't actually go straight from technical requirements to design trade-offs. They talk about technical requirements, then they look at data, and then they move and talk about design trade-offs. Um, so this is a, a hypothesis about the way in which the codes, the things that are meaningful in this uh, engineering simulation, are uh, related to one another in the work that students are doing. Um, now again, uh, if we were, uh, if we had more time, um, I would suggest that uh, each of you think about um, drawing some kind of diagram like this about the codes that are in, that work in your day. There doesn't have to be three codes, obviously, and you don't have to draw the diagram so it looks like this. Um, but in a sense, the thing that you're studying, you're going to express in terms of the stuff that's important in that domain, and then your hypotheses are going to be some way in which those things are related, and you should be able to draw that in some sense to create a visual explanation of the what you think is happening in the uh, in the setting. <laughs> now, of course, I've given you one example, right, of the way in which these things are related. Um, and uh, one of the things I can do to convince you that this is, in fact, the way uh, a, a generic pattern in data is that I could show you more examples, right? I could show you example after example, and eventually you would say, oh, okay, I see that's, that's sort of generally the way students in this situation are acting. Um, in other words, I can saturation, and I can do that in typical qualitative terms by giving you a number of case studies. Um, but there's also an opportunity to use quantitative methods to support this underlying grounded claim that came out of uh, examining the data. Um, in order to do that, uh, let, let's just focus for a second on what it means um, kind of in technical terms for the technical requirements to be connected to the data. Well, we've actually already seen an example of this. I showed you a quotation earlier, right, where the students were talking about um, data and about technical requirements. And so in a sense, in this one chat, in this one thing that the student is saying, the student is actually making a connection between technical requirements and data. But in the example we were just looking at, we also saw that somebody might be talking about design trade-offs, but they're not actually talking about data themselves. The connection is actually back to earlier comments that people are making about data. In other words, as we know, um, people who are in conversation, people who are working together, even a single person working over time, doesn't at every instant make all the connections that are important. They are, what happens now is related to some uh, window of time in the past, some recent temporal context in which activities take place. Um, <clears throat> so we can model those kinds of connections using a moving window. That is, we look at one line of data, one event. This is, happens to be chat data, but could, it could be clickstream data too. And then we look in the recent past um, as to what was happening. Oh, I jumped two slides at once. Um, uh, as to what was happening and see what connections are being made within this window of common ground or recent temporal context. Then we can move to the next line and find the connections there and so on through the data. The idea is that each line of the data, each event, is now represented by the network of connections that it makes both internally and with the previous, uh, previous lines of data. What that means is we can look at the way in which 
those uh, the codes are are systematically related to one another one another over time um, by constructing a network where we show a connection that one uh, turn of talk or one action makes. As the turns of talk progress, there are new connections that are made in this on a uh, uh, developing network. Um, some connections happen over and over again and get reinforced. Um, new connections get added and so and so forth. Um, a different person or a different group of people may make those connections very differently. So a different group might start by linking other things during their uh, during their work, um, reinforcing those links, making new connections, and so on, but winding up with a very different looking uh, pattern. Uh, in other words, um, from the point of view of an epistemic frame, we know that uh, there are codes and those codes are related to one another, but the point is that they're related to one another in particular ways. Some links are stronger than others, some things aren't connected very closely at all, and so on. Um, so this is the basic process of epistemic network analysis. There is a wonderful little video, um, which I'm about to give you the link for, um, which I don't think there's going to be a good way to um, show in this context here. Um, but I definitely recommend taking a look at it at some point. I'll describe briefly what the what's happening in the video in a second. I think there's actually a little ad before it, so be forewarned. I mean, an ad on YouTube when you when you actually get there. Um, there's the link. Uh, so uh, in the, in the video, what you'll what you would see is a um, uh, uh, excerpt from um, uh, uh, Special Victims Units, which is a crime show. Um, and there are a group of people trying to figure out what's happening in the crime. And what you can see in the video um, is the first time through, you just see them, the scene as it would appear. The second time through, you actually see what would be the log file that's created. So you can see the kind of transcription of what they're doing. And then the third time through, you can actually see this epistemic network be constructed in real time. I promise you it's, it's, uh, it's mind blowing, but again, uh, probably better to not take the time to figure out everybody getting to YouTube and, and watching it right now. So I apologize for not being able to blow your mind with it right now. Um, here's the link again so that uh, if people are coming back to this later, they will be able to uh, get to the link even if they weren't um, able to follow the chat along. Uh, um, the point is that um, these we can represent the way in which somebody is understanding a situation by looking at these networks and the way they've accumulated over time. And as we said, one person's network might look different from another person's network. And we can compare those networks by looking at which connections are stronger, which connections are weaker, which connections are missing, and so forth. That works okay for just one or two networks. Um, but if we want to if we want to compare a large number of networks, that's going to become problematic. So one of the things we do in epistemic network analysis is represent each network by its centroid. For those of you who, uh, who don't remember your uh, uh, high school or college mathematics, a centroid is just like the center of mass. So if you imagine that these blue lines were, a, were actually uh, like rods that were connected to each other, um, <clears throat> the thicker ones would be heavier, the thinner ones would be lighter, and the place where all this would balance is at that blue point. Similarly, for the red network, the center of mass would be over on the left because the heavier rods in the network are over on the left, the stronger can. What this means is that we can now compare networks, not just by looking at the actual networks themselves, network graphs themselves, but we have a, a quantitative representation uh, of the relative weighting of the networks in some, what is essentially a network space. Um, I'm gonna elide a bunch of the mathematics. It's in a lot of papers and I'm happy to talk about it at the end if people want. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is that uh, we project the networks into a high dimensional space and then we do a dimensional reduction um, project it back down into um, the uh, two-dimensional space. Um, and then we position the nodes, that is the codes that dr are driving the network, using an optimization routine to align the centroids of the networks with the, the locations of the networks in the projected space. And again, I can say more about that, but um, we'll, we'll start to get in the weeds if I do it right now. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, the projection is designed so that the point of the red network is, is exists where it is because the connections are strongest on the left hand side. The point of the blue network exists where it is because the connections are stronger on the right hand side. Um, and by the way, I just like to point out that the network that I'm showing you, I just showed you, uh, is in fact a, more or less a description of our hypothesis. 
right? The technical technical requirements, connected data, connected design trade-offs. If it's hard to see, just imagine it like this, right? Um, so that's a uh, kind of mathematical representation of the hypothesis that I showed you coming out of a qualitative analysis of uh, student discourse. So now let me actually show you some real data. This is from a small study we did. It's 50 students. They were first year college students. 25 of them are novices. 25 of them are more advanced. Um, and we're going to look at the way in which their, epi their epistemic networks are similar and different. Uh, so uh, it's kind of to cut to the chase. Here is the average network across all of the novices in the simulation. Um, and it's important to note that any one novices network is the connections that they make, but not just the connections that they make within their own th the things they say and do, but connecting to other people who are in their team, which means that what this technique is doing is solving a very important problem in collaborative uh, problem solving or the assessment of collaboration, because we can measure not just what somebody does, but what they do in the context of, the, of their, the work that their teammates are doing. We can see how the team performs as a whole and we can see what each individual's contribution to that performance is. Um, so anyway, here's the, uh, the mean network for the novices. Here's the mean network for the experts. Um, you can see that they're a little different as I put those up, but it's easier to, to see the difference if we just subtract one network for, for the other. So in this representation, the red lines are places where the novices make stronger connections. The blue lines are the places where the students made stronger connections. Um, now, of course, because these networks represent uh, our, sorry, uh, our positions so that we compare each individual network by the centroids, you can see those centroids are kind of tiny in the center. Let me just zoom in on them, right? And what, so what we're seeing here is that each individual point is actually one student, one advanced student or one novice, and where their network sits in this space of networks. And then the points in the center are the averages, the average for the more advanced students, the average for the more novel students. Um, and what that means is that now we can use statistical techniques to compare whether or not these groups of students are similar or different. And in this case, they are statistically uh, significantly different and the effect size is actually fairly large. Um, in other words, what ENA must do is look at the way in which the uh, big C codes in which meaning is constructed and systematically related to it to uh, other meanings in the discourse by looking at the way in which the codes are systematically related to one another and providing us with a statistical test that lets us see whether or not the claim that we're making in this subset of data is statistically significant, meaning that it's going to generalize to the rest of the data. Um, <clears throat> in other words, what we're getting is a warrant for a, a uh, qu quantitative warrant for theoretical saturation. Um, <clears throat> but not only that, we get a, a quantitative warrant for theoretical saturation that we can actually interpret. So we know that these groups are statistically significantly different, and we can see how and why, right? Um, the novice students are making more connections from data to design trade-offs and technical requirements, which, as I said, was our hypothesis about what was happening for the students that we looked at. Um, in other words, uh, they're focusing more strongly on data and the way that it relates to other aspects of the design space. The novices are making more connections between design trade-offs, technical requirements, and collaboration. In other words, they're focusing more on collaboration. And, and, you know, let's be fair, this makes sense. You take a bunch of kids who have barely done any engineering design and you give them a collaborative problem, and one of the first things they're going to need to do is figure out who's supposed to do what. So they talk about, much more about collaboration. The more advanced students don't have to spend as much time explicitly discussing collaboration. They kind of have a model for how that should work. Um, and so they move more as a design problem. Uh, so again, one more question, one more sort of uh, piece of food for thought. In order to do this kind of analysis, data has to be organized in a particular way. That is, you have to be able to systematically record the events and then the codes that are associated with those events. Um, again, you can, I'll let, leave it to you to uh, uh, think about whether or not it's possible to uh, uh, set your data up this way. Um, there's a number of publications that talk about how to do it, including on the Epistemic Network uh, website. Uh, you can actually see a, a how to format your data um, hand, handbook. So um, uh, the representations that, I'm, that I was just showing you come from our, our web kit. Um, we're about to release a new version of it. This is just a small screenshot of the new version of the WebKit um, so that it, to remind me to talk about it. Um, 
which has a, a, a very slick interface that allows you to upload your data. You can transform your, um, construct the network and transform them in real time. You can decide which codes you want to include in the model. Um, you can include or exclude data points. Um, it gives you a, kind of a very robust view of your data that kind of happens in real time. Um, we've also released an R package. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, the R statistical computing software, uh, there's a, a package available that has all of the ENA uh, tools for accumulating networks, um, uh, doing the dimensional reductions, uh, visualizing them, constructing the network uh, graphs, optimizing the position of the nodes, and so forth. Um, I just want to make one more point here uh, before I, we kind of leave this topic. And that is part of what's happening here is we've made a huge compression of the data. This was the work of 50 students who were each working for 10 hours on a design problem in teams where there are thousands of lines of chat and everything is reduced to essentially one dot for each student and a mean of all of those students. But the nice thing about the way that this has been constructed is that when we click on any one of those dots, we can actually see the web of connections that that dot represents. And more than that, we can actually click on any one of the links in the uh, network graph, and we can go back to the original data and see which windows, in which windows, these connections were being constructed. We can go back and interrogate the data and see whether or not the, the mathematical representation of our hypothesis is in fact capturing the thing that we were trying to model in the data. Um, that is, we not only get theoretical saturation, but we get the ability to ground the analysis. We can complete this interpretive loop so that our data analytics are not just finding patterns in the data that we either can't explain or didn't come from some existing hypothesis. Um, we're actually able to take the, uh, a hypothesis, construct a mathematical way of representing that, and then check in the end that in fact the model that we created is doing what we thought it was doing. Um, in other words, these kinds of statistics are not replacing thick description. They're not replacing what we do in closely examining data to understand how and why people are doing what they're doing. We're providing quantitative warrants for the underlying qualitative uh, uh, exercise, uh, which is, of course, why we call this quantitative ethnography. Now, there's one a big example that that gives us, which is we know that the model means what we want it to mean, in a sense. Um, so we can use those models and show them to learners and show them to teachers in a way that's much more actionable. So this is a, a interface that we built for our virtual internships that lets teachers and the people running the internships see the connections that students are making. So they can see the actual chat feed. Um, we don't in currently include the click stream, although we're doing some work on including that now, but you can see the activity as it unfolds over time. You can see the network of connections that students are making in the domain. And actually, it becomes easy to suggest interventions. Why? Because if I know the, which connections are most important in the domain, and I know which connections students are made, have made, all I have to do is look and see which connections they didn't make yet and suggest that they consider some relationships uh, in what they're working on uh, that they haven't yet seen. Um, <clears throat> so, to, so to round out here, um, the, the idea is that um, quantitative ethnography um, is a tool that lets us uh, pursue thick descriptions, but use big data to support them. In other words, this is big data for thick description. It's not just big data from uh, mining for um, patterns and then trying to figure out what those patterns might mean. Um, to borrow from uh, Clifford Geertz, who's one of the most uh, famous ethnographers of the last century, he argued that the essential task of ethnography is not to codify abstract regularities, but to make thick description possible. Not to generalize across cases, but to generalize within them. To make sure that, the, that we understand in a very robust way how some group of people is actually acting in the world. Um, so before I stop, I should point out that there are a large number of people who have been working with this tool and in particular helping develop it. And I hope perhaps as a result of uh, the conversation that we might have in, after I'm done today, uh, that you might even consider uh, joining us. Um, we're also grateful for uh, funding from the uh, number of foundations, including uh, in particular the National Found Science Foundation, which has uh, invested about $10 million in developing this toolkit. Um, and uh, I'll skip that because we have some nice swag, but I can't give it to you because we're online. Um, 
Uh, and perhaps most important, there's a book that just came out recently um, that essentially describes everything that I've just been talking about. Um, it does it uh, both as kind of a how-to book, that is, how do you think about organizing your data? How do you think about constructing the models? How do you think about interpreting models? But even more important, it's kind of a why-to book, so that uh, any modeling exercise involves making a number of decisions. The book is actually um, designed to help people think through what decisions they're making, why, and what the consequences of those are going to be. Um, okay, so uh, let me stop there um, and uh, throw the floor open for questions. Um, I'm not sure whether it's better to ask questions in audio or uh, in text, and I will defer to uh, my hosts as to how they want to handle it. Um, but I want to uh, uh, thank the Ascalite and uh, everybody who's attended for a, a chance to chat with you. And I look forward to uh, following up on questions that you have and then um, hopefully following up later uh, with uh, things that people want to do to collaborate uh, in the future. Thank you very much, David, for that. That was fantastic. It's been a real privilege having you uh, present for us here uh, through the LAC webinar for Ascalite. Um, if anyone has any questions, please type them in the chat window. I believe we can't turn on the microphones for the attendees, uh, but we're keeping an eye out right now in the chat window for questions. While we're waiting for people to formulate, formulate or type their questions, um, uh, I should just say that um, one of the things that our funding from the National Science Foundation makes possible is a group of um, students in my lab uh, whose job is to help people who are unfamiliar with these techniques learn to use them. So if you have um, data that you're interested in trying this technique out with, um, you can, if you get in touch with me, I can put you in touch with that team and they can help you work with formatting your data and thinking about how to organize it for a model. Um, okay, so it seems like there's a couple of questions here. I guess we should just take these in order. Um, so one of them is how, how is it similar or different to SNAP? Um, I'm actually not sure. Uh, I, perhaps I should know off the top of my head, or maybe I'm just thinking slowly because I'm uh, jet lagged. But I, if somebody, if um, Reem wants to, to uh, say a little bit about what SNAP is, I'd be happy to make the comparison. Um, okay, in the meantime, um, Cassandra asks uh, whether or not we have developed automated ways of coding data, uh, like rather than just manual coders having coders training a machine? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we talk about, I talk about that in the book, Quantitative Ethnography. Um, that's actually, uh, if we had more time, I have a whole section uh, talking both about the automated coding tools that we've developed and actually about some very serious problems um, that uh, occur in the entire field of uh, automated coding and even in manual coding with integrated reliability. Um, uh, the, we, the tool we've developed is called Encoder, and essentially what it does is let you upload a corpus of data, uh, define a code, meaning talk about pick a code that you want to be able to identify, um, give a few uh, starting keywords, and then the system uses um, uh, active, uh, active machine learning um, to work with you to develop a, a robust and valid coding scheme. Um, okay, uh, sorry, I'm just going to head back up here. Um, so somebody's asking about posting videos on YouTube. Um, I don't know whether that's videos of this talk as a whole, which I think will be available online. And I did um, videos that I was uh, that I was re referring to uh, when I was presenting slides. Um, uh, uh, hey, uh, so Hazel answered that question as well. Um, oh, social network analysis. OK, sure. So the SNAP question is about social network analysis. So um, uh, epistemic network analysis is a network analysis tool, so it shares some family resemblances with social network analysis. Um, there actually are people, uh, Dragon Gasovich, who's coming to Monash University here, some other folks in our lab, Ken Frank in um, at, uh, Michigan State, who are looking at combining social and epistemic network analysis. Uh, there's a couple ways of thinking about that. So one of them is social network analysis records who spoke to whom, but it doesn't record the content. So it's a kind of structural analysis of interactions rather than, uh, rather than an analysis based on content. Um, the other thing about social network about analysis is that um, at least as it's con typically conducted, uh, social network analysis has no um, inherent in spatial embedding for the positioning of the nodes. So 
uh, what you're looking at is structural properties of the network. Is it dense? Is it loose? Does it have clicks and so forth? Um, but you're not actually looking to, you, it's very difficult to compare two networks uh, based on a visualization because there's no natural, particularly natural way of constructing a visualization. An epistemic network analysis, because what we're actually interested in is not just whether their students make a lot of connections or a few connections, but which connections they make. We had to develop a set of tools to be able to construct a meaningful spatial embedding. That's what, that, that's what you're looking at when we talk about the centroids and the positions of the nodes in space. Um, and so that's a, that actually gives it a lot of computational um, and uh, analytic and interpretive power over more traditional social network analytic tools. You could, of course, use many of the same tools from SNA on ENA-like data, and uh, there is possible also to use ENA tools on social network analysis data. Uh, the main limitation of ENA is that in order for it to work, uh, you have to have the same set of nodes across either multiple time points or multiple different groups or multiple individuals. So SNA often doesn't have that. Um, but that's, that's sort of in a nutshell what the differences are. Um, okay, uh, moving down. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, uh, there, there's so many comments here. I'm trying to um, uh, uh, figure out where I am here. Um, so, um, uh, so yes, uh, I saw there were a couple of comments about looking at um, links in forums, and uh, yeah, so there's so an, an easy way to think about that is if you're looking at links in forums, you could see who's responding to whom, but you could also see what the content of their responses are, and those are kind of two different uh, ways of thinking about uh, an analysis. Um, uh, uh, somebody point, pointed a link to the encoder tool. Um, you are welcome to use it. It it is it is researchware. Um, meaning that uh, we actually need to redesign the whole system so it doesn't crash a lot um, in the spring. Um, again, we're happy to have some of our team um, help you use it, but that tool in particular, I recommend that you don't just uh, take out for a test drive on your own, or if you do, fasten your seatbelt. Um, uh, somebody asked about the moving window size, um, which of course has a, uh, a huge impact on the way the model is constructed. Um, that's also a, a longer discussion. The book Quantitative Ethnography has essentially a, a, most of a chapter devoted to that question. Um, there are, and we have some papers that will be at, uh, we hope will be at ICLS that are dealing with that as well. There was one that came out uh, the last conference at CSCL and there'll be a new one coming out soon. Um, the, uh, the idea of the window is what it's trying to re represent is something that Dan Southers refers to as recent temporal context. Um, more generally, it's this idea of common ground. So when people are in a conversation or when people are, are acting together, uh, there's a certain window of time over which they assume that somebody will remember what was just said. Um, meaning that um, I don't have to repeat something in order to make sure that everybody is following along with what I'm talking about. I mean, you see this in conversations all the time, right? People use Dyxis, they talk about this and that. Um, uh, and don't refer to some specific antecedent because they assume that everybody remembers the thing they were just talking about. Um, as you go further back in time, um, uh, essentially, uh, in, an individual person trusts less that the other people in the conversation will remember what it is that they remember. It's not that they've forgotten, it's that they are less sure that somebody else has forgotten. Um, and so what they typically do is reintroduce a, con a concept into the discussion. Um, so what we have to capture is not how far back anyone ever makes a link between things, because if somebody's going to make a very distant link, they will actually bring the thing they're linking back into the current context. Otherwise, it's impossible for everybody else to follow along. You see this in, in books too, right? Somebody in a methods textbook or something. Uh, over a short span of time, you don't have to kind of re-invoke an idea. Over a longer span of time, you do. Um, so the window is trying to capture. Um, there's a few ways of looking at what the appropriate size is. Um, one of the best is obviously just to take a bunch of uh, random time points in the conversation and look back and see how far you have to go in order to understand what the content of the of one particular turn is, um, what one particular action or one particular turn of talk. Um, and then you can imagine constructing a screed plot, right? If you go back no turns at all, there'll be a bunch of connections you miss. If you go back two turns, then there are going to be fewer connections that you miss. If you go back 10 turns, you're going to miss almost none. If you go back 20 turns, you're going to miss an even smaller amount. And there's kind of diminishing returns 
uh, to that process of expanding the window. So that's one way of determining it. Um, another thing that we've uh, started doing is actually just running models at multiple window sizes, and we see where the model stabilizes. So at some point, um, there's not really additional information to be had. The model isn't changing very much as we include more, more data in it. Um, so this is a topic of actual active research in our group is kind of how to figure out and perhaps even how to provide better tools for determining what that window size is. In general, you know, you're looking at student conversations. Um, it's something, you know, between four and eight turns of talk. Um, and that, that sort of makes sense. Um, uh, if you uh, if you think about it. there's other data from other fields that suggest something similar um, and what we see often is that um, the models are pretty robust to the difference so if I make a model with five uh, with a window size of five and I make a window si model with a window size of seven I'm not going to so it's good to try and figure out uh, kind of empirically what what window size makes sense for your data but you don't have to be that precise about it because the model won't necessarily change that much um okay so um, okay. um i see there's one more question that sakina asked as well and i have two minutes so let me see if i can say something about that and then two minutes. Uh, we'll leave it we'll leave a moment to wrap up here um uh, so sakina uh says it looks like what you've done here is really combining the strength of quantitative and qualitative research and fusing them together as a researcher being able to then visualize the data the way you have done what value do you see as the most valuable for uh, valuable for in inference making? Um, yeah, so that's that's a great point, and this is exactly what quantitative ethnography is trying to do. Um, it's trying not to do mixed methods research, where you do some qualitative research and some quantitative research, and you know triangulate between them. Um, it's actually trying to merge them so that they are um, they are on the same intellectual and conceptual playing field, and they are actually working to get directly together. Um, and I think the biggest value for that uh, for me is that you have the opportunity um, both to do exploratory analyses using qualitative or quantitative data and then um, use the same uh, assumptions and the same data and the same ideas to look at it from another perspective, either from the qualitative or the quantitative perspective. Um, so it helps with, your, with data exploration. Um, and then also it's the ability to do some to do confirmatory work to say, you know, either I saw this hypothesis, I saw this happen in my models, and now I can confirm it by going back to the qualitative data, because the models will tell me where the qualitative data driving the model is. Or I can come up with a qualitative model, and then I can attach a, a test of statistical significance to it to warrant theoretical separation. Um, so the power is actually right there in the merging of the two methods. Not to mention, as Sakina says, that you get a nice visual representation for communicating very easily what the differences in discourse that you're pointing at. Um, and it's a math, sort of mathematically robust representation. Um, so Sakina, let me stop. I, I don't know what you want to do in terms of closing things off, but I want, don't want people to feel like they are walking out of the, the end. Yes, thank you everyone for attending today. Thank you so much, David, for sharing your work with us. Um, we will be sending out the link to the webinar recording in time. It will also be available on the Escalite um, LA SIG website. So you will be able to view this again. Thank you so much, David. Uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your stay in Australia. Yes, thank you. I'm having a great time. And I'm just going to quick type my email here. Um, quick type my email here. Um, uh, and please, I hope that people will uh, get in touch if you uh, UK. I spelled it wrong. It's ed that should be education. Um, but please feel free to get in touch. Uh, we have folks who are uh, interested and excited to work with you and your data. We learn uh, more about the technique by working with different kinds of data and different researchers and their questions. Um, so please reach out if you're at all interested. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for your kind words, Cassandra. Thank you. <laughs>